What you're about to experience is one man's quest to see beyond the tumultuous period we're in and to envision what lies just beyond our grasp, yet well within our reach. Welcome to Larry Rifkin's America Trends, where the future has arrived, and it's just in time. So who hasn't heard of 23andMe or Ancestry.com? You think about genetic testing to find out who we are. It's all the rage in America today. Where did we come from? What baggage are we carrying around? And then everybody wants to know about their family tree and their lineage. And there's all this generational cleansing that's going on where people recognize that unless they understand where they came from, they're not going to be able to sort out who they are today and try to make a better person in the present so i've got to ask you john i mean you had a bit of a surprise when you sent some dna away to have it tested what did you find i did i well <laughs> i i found well i found out what i already knew but i did find out that i'm a one percenter what does that mean i'm a one percent african-american and i didn't i i can't the, he, see here's the problem with it so i got this genetic yeah back right so now i'm i'm trying to find and and i have a lot of people who match my dna but i haven't been able to figure out none of the names match so if i put my name in or i put the russian name in i can't so i got matches but i don't got matches if you know what i mean well explain it a little more clearly to our well america well, trends well, audience what they, here. well what they do yeah is, what do is, they do is, is you, you you spit into this uh, vile, yeah, and you sounds send, rather you, you vile. mail it to me. It was vile, yeah, but, and you mail it to them, right? And then they put you in the computer, and they they take your DNA and they match it up with everybody else, and you know they give you a list of people who are you know first cousins, second cousins, third cousins, fourth cousins, you know all the way down up to <laughs> the tenth cousins, and. uh which is which is good. It's very interesting, and you know, and, and I've written to a few people, and I've been trying to figure out how this works. And I, I think a lot of people, especially on the Jewish side, are having problems because in Russia they didn't keep records because they own nothing, so they just traveled about and they must mingle among themselves. <laughs> Right. I think it so. turns out that just about everyone <laughs> in Eastern Europe is related in some way. I think that's ultimately what uh, we discovered, right? Ultimately, yes. Now, did you find out that you were related to some type of Egyptian pharaoh or something while you're wearing the no, toga or no? I, no, no. no. Not... I, I'm working on that. I'm trying to find. I must have some famous relative out there. <laughs> now, <laughs> but when, I haven't been able to find one. <laughs> when we all started out, I mean, let's be honest. When we started families and you and I started our families probably right. around the same time, we were more likely, I would think at that time, and I'm going back now to the early 80s, to go to a psychic or a fortune teller to get information that was probably more reliable than any of the science that was available at that time. Well, right? that's that's true. That this was not available. I mean, this is this is still in infancy now. They're just finding out, you know, how much more they can do with this. So. I mean, we're just on the on the edge of this thing, I think. Oh, but I think there are some incredible advances just on the way. But when you and I, again, were having our families, did you go to Lamaze classes? Oh, yeah. And did you have the prenatal ultrasound that you showed to oh, everyone? Yeah, yeah, that little yeah, black yeah, and yes. white photo. Yes. <laughs> Look, here's my finest creation. And people trying to discern whether they could find any male body parts or something, right? Well, I think at the time, when we go back almost 30 years, amniocentesis was something that was perhaps there but it was a big deal it wasn't something you right, did right, right at right, that time at that time no well think about how far we have come i mean did you ever think then that if this came back with some kind of warning signal at the time of what your child might be carrying what you would do 
Did you ever think about that? No, I never even it never even occurred to me. So well, that, that, that. what's amazing now is that you can test for almost any eventuality. And I find that to be a little bit disconcerting because I don't know exactly what you do with that information and whether that information, number one, is reliable. For example, with some of these commercially available things that you are now reading about, 23andMe, you did Ancestry.com. Right. You have telos years to tell you how old you really are in terms of how you've <laughs> right, uh, right. handled your body. Right. You've got all this stuff. How reliable do you think that stuff is? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, we need a as somebody that knows about this to to tell us because i i still think this a lot of this stuff is they're too they're, early they're on yeah they're still learning about it they're still you know they're still finding new things every day about our dna and and how it works and it's it's very complicated but i mean what would you like to know or what would you have well, liked to that, have known about your children or you know the impending uh you know uh, onset of uh, a pregnancy what, what did you want to know or did you did you want to know anything or was it because every other generation knew nothing and we all took well, pot luck and i i think that's it we knew nothing but then then do we want to know? I mean, I don't know. I, I, I've been wondering about taking that, what is it, 23 and Me. Yeah, when, when, yeah. And, and that I, one, I've, they can go, the $99 package, I think you just find out that's just about your chromosomes. Right. The other tells you what everything, you're likely to. Everything, you know, yeah. but I'm like, you know, I, I'm on the edge with that one. Yeah, that's a, that's a <laughs> tricky one. I mean, how many of us want to know? I mean, we know that at the end of the day, it all ends pretty badly for right, all of right. us. We yeah. know that. Yes. But one of the things about life is, I think, not knowing when and how uh, allows you to get up every morning exactly. and think that this whole Keep journey going. is worth it. Right. Yeah. Exactly. But, John, we do have to recognize that scientists have this master playbook now. And it can reveal just about anything that you want to know or don't want to know from the beginning. So I was reading, of course, a book. And we're going to be accenting that book in a moment. And if you take the language of DNA and you place it in these discrete little units that we call genes, and they are housed within 46 chromosomes, and you can take a very individualized look at each of us. And, uh, well, look, we're not wearing lab coats. That's I mean, John sure. and I are not doing that for today's <laughs> America trends. But we will not sacrifice a frog <laughs> in the making of this episode either because uh, remember doing that john i mean yeah, you remember oh, that yeah, right? oh yeah how yeah, good were you terrible. at dissection i hated that Ugh. really oh yeah well you were already an advanced yeah. member of the species i mean you <laughs> didn't want to kill any harmless uh, creature i i know you john you're a good man but uh so we have this user's guide to our makeup but the real question is how do we use it this all gets really interesting from here, John. And I got to okay. tell you, there's this thing called Huntington's Paradox that tells us a lot about ourselves. And I found this fascinating because before they found the gene for Huntington's disease, about 75% of those at risk for having it wanted to know their genetic makeup. And then the test became available and only 25% wanted to know their genetic <laughs> predisposition. So the question is, why? Why is that? And it gets to some of the things that you were saying. Right, exactly. It's, I don't know. Yeah. I know. I, I want to know, but I don't want to know. I'm well, just... remember the name Dr. Ezekiel Emanuel? Yes. Yep. He's the godfather of yep. an orphan himself. Well, I'm talking about the Affordable Care Act. <laughs> but uh, he said that in the abstract, more information always seems desirable. We all want it. Right. But in reality, not so much. <laughs> I agree. So he reminds us that we're hardwired to consider positive outcomes and maybe shackled with too much information. But really, John, think about life itself. I mean, who really wants to think about the road ahead? We really don't. But we now can. And that really presents a dilemma for many. So we have now shared with our listeners perhaps more than they want to know, and we've exposed <laughs> our own fears and anxieties and ignorance of biology. So we're going to add someone to this conversation who has a lot more to say about opening up the genetic Pandora's box. And I'm speaking about Bonnie Rocheman. She's a fine journalist, John. She's the author of The Gene Machine, How Genetic Technologies Are Changing the Way We Have Kids and the Kids We Have. Are you interested in wow. this? Oh, yes. 
Very interesting. Well, you're going to find this fascinating. So we're going to welcome Bonnie to our conversation today on America Trends. All right, let's do it. I'm speaking to Bonnie Rockman, a fine journalist and the author of the book, The Gene Machine, How Genetic Technologies Are Changing the Way We Have Kids and the Kids We Have. Bonnie, when you were pregnant, you were offered a battery of genetic tests. Did you think that was a good development, or were you concerned at having too much information to sort through at that time? I thought it was a good development, but I may be unique in this aspect. So being a journalist, that's my life's work. So I'm a seeker of information. I'm someone who always wants to ask that extra question and always wants to know more. So I was appreciative of the opportunity to dive deeper into my unborn children's DNA. Some people, however, can find that information anxiety-provoking as opposed to empowering. Well, what about the now what question? Because that was something that you had to confront uh, in reality. Even if we know more, can we really do much about it? And you, for example, had this chromosomal quirk, and it turned out to be inconsequential. So I I am still glad that I know about that. It took me a while to come around to that viewpoint. But, um, you know, let me, I'll, I'll go back and just explain a little bit about what had happened. So in the course of prenatal testing, I, th- I think really that what's happening these days is that, um, and it's sort of a universal truth, you know, the more you look for something, the more, the, it, if you look for something wrong, you're going to find something. And that's because human beings are not perfect. Um, we're all born with genetic mutations. So, um, you know, it, even it, the fact that you may not know about them doesn't mean that you still, that you don't have them. And so during the course of, um, of a routine ultrasound in my second trimester with my third child, um, there was a, um, there was a, a, a strange finding, um, a cyst on her brain, which I have to say sounded really terrifying. Um, so I was offered, uh, so I was told, okay, it could mean absolutely nothing. And sometimes these, and quite often, actually, these cysts, just basically, you know, fluid-filled bubbles get reabsorbed. Or it could be a marker, an indication of a genetic condition called trisomy 18, which is um, essentially where you have three copies of the 18th chromosome instead of the standard two. And trisomy 18 is um, very debilitating. Often babies will die before birth or, um, you know, typically shortly after birth, although there are some instances of um, children living but with a a pretty diminished quality of life. And so I was, there. you know, the doctor said, um, well, you can just hang out and watch and wait and see what happens when you give birth. Or you can um, have an amniocentesis, so, you know, analyzing um, fetal cells to determine whether this is actually the case. So, again, me being um, someone who really craves information, I knew there was no way I was going to be able to sit tight for it would have been about another four months and just wait. Um, and furthermore, I wanted to be, um, I wanted to be prepared. So I had that, I had the amniocentesis. Um, fortunately, it showed that um, trisomy 18 was not uh, was not a concern, and I thought, you know, case closed, fantastic, um, moving on. Mm-hmm. And then um, I had asked for the lab report, and I think this is um, this is the, because I'm the daughter of a doctor, so I'd asked for a lab the lab report just to be sent to me, just kind of for my records. And turns out that you know I get that lab report several days later, and um, it indeed confirms the absence of trisomy 18, but it confirms the presence of something called inversion 9, which means that my daughter's ninth chromosome is flipped. So the top part's on the bottom and the bottom part is on the top. And there's no missing genetic material, which is really good news. But it's just sort of like if you put your shirt, um, <laughs> your shirt where your pants go and your pants where your shirt goes. So, the, you know, just not in the right place. And it's considered uh, clinically insignificant, which in lay person terms means don't worry about it but of course you know I, of course you know it's your your baby of course you're worried about it um and so i was really i was kind of freaked out in the beginning and then over time i decided um 
it was just some of the information about my daughter that I just had to synthesize into kind of the whole picture of this wonderful kid. Um, who she is. And, um, you know, I've tucked it away so that let's say there is information down the road that associates this um, this uh, genetic error with um, a particular disease or a heightened risk for something. At least I'll be able to know so that, that if there's something to do about it, I will, I'll have that knowledge. So, uh, you know, again, it comes back to I found, I, I did indeed find that knowledge um, kind of um, overwhelming and a little scary in the beginning. But then once I had time to process it, I realized, you know, this is actually really good information because um, I want to be, you know, I want to take care of my of my daughter as best I can. And that involves being able to um, to know about any genetic risks. That, but what do you have um, to know about yourself mitigate? and the way that you process information to want this kind of data point on your child early on? Uh, because you seem like an inquiring person who can rationally uh, kind of ferret out what's happening here. But there may be others who get a little bit more emotional about these things, and it may leave them wondering, worrying, and uh, being very concerned in ways that might not be terribly useful if they can't do anything about it. Yeah, you know, I think, I mean, that's one thing that I, I really um, advocate for in this book and just in general. Um, you have to know how you handle information and how you process information and kind of ju just in life in general, not just when it comes to genetic testing in kids. Um, but, you know, are you the kind of person who um, – who really wants to, you know, let's say you're going on a trip, do you do uh, tons and tons of research before you <laughs> i got to admit, Bonnie, I don't. <laughs> My sister don't, does. But I okay. want to kind of feel it as I'm going along. And, I mean, we plan it, but I don't get into every uh, point of minutia and where's the next gas station just in case we run out or whatever. My sister does that kind of planning, so we're a little right. bit different. it's like type A. You yeah. know, are you type A or are you not? Mm. So, you know, you might be the kind of person who really doesn't crave all that information. I mean, you know, if you kind of take it to the next step, um, there. I was just at a genetics conference last week, and um, there was a lot of talk. And I've gone to several of these genetics conferences, and for the first time, there was a lot of talk from multiple institutions and multiple companies about sequencing genomes of healthy people. So pretty much, you know, since genome sequencing has been um, has been around for um, you know for a couple decades. It's really been used exclusively, for the most part, to either diagnose some mysterious disease or to you know certainly it's just used on people who are sick and who have some sort of disease mm -hmm. to provide insight into that. But you know there, it seems like there is um, there's starting to be a shift into people who are just curious. There um, <laughs> there were a couple of really funny terms for this kind of curiosity. One was the the narcissome, so narcissistic <laughs> genome. <laughs> Someone else called it the elective genome. So, you know, obviously this is not for everyone, and I think a bear is pointing out it's for people who have pretty deep pockets also because this is certainly not something, you know, kind of just like a genetic spelunking, just exploration for, you know, for the heck of it. It's not something that your insurance company is going to foot the bill for. But, you know, do, are, do you know, it, it, I think it's going to increasingly be part of, kind of of the, the the social and cultural conversation. Like, do you want this information about, not only about your kids, but about yourself? Because if there are companies that are offering it, you know, it's out there for the taking. And do you want that sort of information? How reliable is the commercially available information uh, today that a lot of people are seeing advertised on television? Um, you know, I, it really varies from company to company, of course. And, you know, something like sequencing your genome, well, that involves, you know, um, kind of a deep dive into all 20,000 plus um, genes that um, that a person has. Um, there are other companies like 23andMe that do a much narrower read. But I mean, it's for the most part, it's pretty accurate. You know, it can give you pictures of um, kind of, it can give you a sense of maybe what you might you know, kind of what to expect uh, down the road, what you might be at heightened risk for. And in some situations, there might be things that you can do about it. I mean, the truth is, when I've spoken to doctors about this, so much 
it, it kind of on a global level, so much of what you can do to kind of lower your risk for various cancers, for example, is the kind of stuff that we already know that we should be doing, eat healthy, exercise. Mm-hmm. And um, so it kind of remains to be seen. Do you actually need this information that you're at greater risk for, um, for various diseases? Do you need that kind of information to kind of spur you into going to the gym every day? Maybe so. How much information now can we gather about our child? Uh, Is it endless now with the 20,000 genes and the new technology? We can know just about anything if we have the resources. Is that the case? Uh, That is not entirely the case, and I'll tell you why. So there there are certain diseases such uh, um, there are certain diseases um, that are that result from a change in a single gene. Those are called single gene disorders. And if you have that change in a single gene, you're going to develop the disease. But there are so many more conditions that are a function. uh, For example, most cancers, they're a function of, uh, you know, genetic mutations combined with environment. Mm -hmm. And why does someone develop cancer and someone else doesn't? It is not always... um, it is, not, it is not always solely genetic in nature. For example, you really need no look, look, look no farther than, um, than BRCA mutations, breast cancer mutations, which, you know, have been in the news. Oh, yeah, Angelina Jolie. Yeah, I mean, exactly. You, you have you to put to that in context Angelina. for us as to how important uh, her revelations have been in this field. Yeah, well, I mean, there is even something in the medical field now called quote, unquote, the Angelina effect, <laughs> because uh, several years ago when, when Angelina went public and said um, she had her ovaries removed and later her breasts removed because she, was, uh, she had a genetic mutation that put her at increased risk of developing breast and ovarian cancer, that had, um, that had a real cultural impact in that lots of people started, go- first of all, for the first time, it really brought genetics to the forefront front and made it a national conversation um, because she is such a celebrity. And secondly, it made a lot of people go to their doctors and request testing. Um, some people who should have been tested, lots of people who really were not at increased risk for, uh, you know, in terms of their, their family history. But it did certainly jumpstart um, a national conversation. And I think that's, um, that's really valuable. It kind of demystified um, you know, demystified genes and genetics for a lot of people. But, like, what, you know, to go back to what I was saying, if you have this mutation, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're going to develop the disease. So, you know, when we're trying to learn all this information at our kid, about our kids, even from birth, you can learn things like, I mean, certainly if there is disease present, you could, you could theoretically detect that. But you also, most of what you're going to learn is a lot of information about potential increased risk, you know, you know, maybe decades down the road. So, you know, with this, you know, even if your child would have a BRCA mutation, that doesn't mean that your child is definitely going to get breast cancer. It means that your kid is at increased risk of developing breast cancer, but not everyone who has this mutation goes on And I on know you're right about that, Bonnie, but knowing that at birth, in the case of Angelina Jolie, we found that out when she was an adult. I mean, walking around with that information, carrying that around through your life, uh, both the first uh, your mother and father knowing this, then you knowing it, I mean, what does that add in terms of the many burdens we're already carrying around? Well, again, you know, it really goes back to how comfortable you are with information. But I can give you a really specific example of what that can add. So, for example... Say that a baby is tested at birth and that a BRCA mutation is discovered. Well, first of all, current kind of conventional wisdom and practice is that parents should not be notified about adult onset conditions because that kind of takes away the right of the child to future autonomy. However, you can envision this circumstance where it actually might be really helpful to know about it. So let's say that a baby, let's say like a six-week-old girl is found to have a BRCA mutation. And so most likely that mutation has um, been inherited from her mom or her dad. Let's say it was inherited from her mom. And let's say her mom has no clue that she has it. 
So by telling the mom that her daughter has it, then the mom could in turn be tested. And if the mom is positive for this genetic mutation, all of a sudden the mom knows that she needs to basically step up her surveillance or make different choices from what she's doing. So those different choices can range from just, for example, pairing MRIs with mammograms or getting mammograms more frequently or, um, you know, it, you could kind of take it a step further and, you know, go the Angelina route and have a, you have a prophylactic mastectomy, remove your ovaries to decrease risk. But basically, it puts you in the driver's seat as opposed to being clueless and not knowing what, you know, not knowing about this, this pretty significant increased risk of breast cancer. So in that way, it can be very, very helpful to know about mutations that your child has, because I, I think that's one thing that's so interesting and certainly unique about genetic information is that it just doesn't, in, mo in so many cases, it doesn't just come out of the blue. It's often inherited from previous generations. And there are many who, of course, feel differently. Uh, Joel Feinberg, he's a legal philosopher, and he argues that children have a right to a, quote, open future, not fettered by the destiny abnormal genes may predict for them. I know you don't agree with him on that. <laughs> well, you know, do I agree with him on that? I um, very much respect him. He is um, a really brilliant legal mind, and I see where he is coming from. I, I completely understand what he's saying, but I think that in the case of, for example, that the, the breast cancer example that I just gave you, um, yeah, and there's a doctor who I quote in the book is that if we're talking about, you know, first do no harm, which mm. is that, you know, the oath that physicians take, you know, you, you, you're doing harm. You would theoretically be doing harm by keeping information about a breast cancer mutation from a mom and then having that mom um, get an, an aggressive form of cancer and die. Um, it perhaps it sounds a little far fetched, but I mean it could certainly happen. And so if you're talking about um, preventing harm to a child, well, I really I, I'm a little biased. I'm a mother, but I can't think of a more a better way to prevent harm to a child than by um, making sure that that mom is around to raise that child. Oh, I understand fully. And in your book, because I don't want people to misunderstand what it is that we're saying here about wanting to know and then taking as many uh, preventative uh, approaches as you can as you go along, but Chapter 3, you indicate the other scarlet A, abortion's relationship to genetic testing. Some might say, is this going to give much wider birth uh, to people having abortions because they realize that uh, there could be uh, problems uh, as it relates to this child's uh, health and well-being going along? So, in theory, of course. So the more people that find out um, that their pregnancy is not proceeding as they had hoped, Certainly one possibility is that they could choose to end the pregnancy. But I really think it's a misconception that, um, a, that prenatal testing is synonymous with abortion. Far from it. There are many people who do testing not because they have any intention of ending the pregnancy if they get test results that are not what they had hoped for. There are a bunch of reasons why you might want to learn ahead of time, for example, that you're uh, that your baby will have Down syndrome. And here are some of those reasons. So about half of babies with Down syndrome have heart defects that require surgical correction. Let's say you live in the middle of the country in a very rural area. Well, if you're having a child with Down syndrome, you may want to change the hospital where you're delivering to one that has um, you know, has uh, better facilities in case your child will need um, to have surgery or will just need extra attention at birth. Um, you also, for example, if you're having a child with Down syndrome, you may want to align yourself with resources. So connect with other families who have kids with Down syndrome ahead of time to kind of know what to expect and what sorts of things you may want to prepare for. So, you know, you can see that it's not, I really don't think that, um, I don't think that prenatal testing is, is necessarily a fast track to abortion. What prenatal testing does is it's a fast track to information. 
And then what you do with that information is very individual, and it's up to each particular family. When you know that there are so many competitive pressures, Bonnie, in our society, and when we see people wanting to get their children into a preschool uh, that gives them some kind of advantage in paying $28,000 a year, we see this notion that my child's got to be perfect, my child has to be better, and I'm going to do everything I can. Is there a risk? I know in my family, in my mother's uh, family, uh, the last born had Down syndrome, and she was such a gift, such a joy. Uh, and yet there are many families who might not look at it that way. Absolutely, and that's why I said that it is um, uh, what prenatal testing is doing is providing information. So it's increased access to information, and then what each individual family, each set of prospective parents does with that information is up to them based on kind of what they feel their values are, what they feel they can handle, um, you know, a whole myriad of considerations. And, um, you know, abortion is legal in this country, and it is certainly an option, but it is far from the only option. And just because someone finds out that they are having a child whose chromosomes are not absolutely perfect does not necessarily mean that they're going to have an abortion. I interviewed plenty of families who, um, you know, who feel like it's a blessing to have children who, um, who have particular genetic conditions, and they would never consider having an abortion. So again, it's just up to each. I mean, I agree with you with what you say that there is, um, there is this drive in our culture to kind of, uh, you know, have these babies and raise children who are gifted in every sort of way. But I think, you know, in some situations I talk to, um, especially some families who have kids with Down syndrome, um, and, and, you know, one mom in particular who I've interviewed, she, she doesn't appear in the book, but she certainly informed um, a lot of my thinking. She's a graduate of Princeton University, and she had a child with Down syndrome. She did not know ahead of time. And her thinking really has evolved. So she always just assumed that she was going to have a child like herself who would go on to a prestigious college and just do really well, excel in school. And she's had to recalibrate her thinking about her, not only her daughter, but kind of what really matters in life and is a good life um, being able to study and understand Immanuel Kant. Well, maybe she used to think that, but she doesn't anymore. You say that as of today, we are not really prepared to understand, quote, the stories the genes may whisper or shout within our bodies, unquote. Could you elaborate on that? Sure, sure. So, you know, that goes back to what I was saying about genes not always being destiny. So in some situations, um, you know, genetics is so complex. And in some situations, if you have a mutation, a change in a gene, it um, it correlates, you know, one-to-one -one with development of that disease. But in so many other cases, it just means that you are at increased risk and that, that there are a multiplicity of other factors that are going to, going to come into play. So th where you live, the food you eat, the air you breathe, um, the opportunities that you have growing up, all of that is going to play into, um, you know, potential development of disease. So, it, you know, it's not correct in many instances to attribute everything to um, to nature. Um, a lot of it is nurture as well. And I think that that is, I think that that's the good news in much of this is that, uh, you know, genes, it's not correct to, to, to say, you know, oh, well, that's my destiny and there's nothing I can do to avert it. Um, you know, there, there are a lot of factors that, that go into determining um, eventual development of disease. Well, Bonnie, you know better than anyone that uh, there's this buzzword today, CRISPR, C-R-I-S-P-R. Explain that to us. Sure. So CRISPR is a pretty phenomenal and very exciting um, gene editing technology. So, you know, the way it works is, um, you know, you, if you imagine, um, if you imagine a, a genetic mutation as a typo in a, a term paper. 
So CRISPR can go in and essentially cut out that typo or pave over that typo or add a little something to kind of make that typo not so severe. And um, so that is really the next, that's really the next frontier. That's um, the direction in which we're going. And there are a, a bunch of researchers all over the world who are using CRISPR gene editing technology and trying to harness that technology to treat and in some cases even cure disease. Um, so that's really that's really what we have to look forward to. Is there a way to um, correct genetic errors and to mitigate, to lessen symptoms of disease, or in some cases even to cure that disease? When you hear the term eugenics raised in any of these types of conversations about your book, The Gene Machine, uh, how does that strike you if people are looking at this slippery slope and they reference eugenics? Well, you know, eugenics, I, I think I, I was very conflicted about it until I spoke um, in depth with a, um, a law professor at Georgia State University named Paul Lombardo. He has done a lot of research and written some books about eugenics. And he pointed out to me that eugenics I guess to really qualify as eugenics, it has to be state-sponsored. Um, and so, you know, if you think back to um, the Nazi era, and even right here in the U United States, um, many states had laws on the books for years about um, about sterilizing people who were consider considered uh, mentally deficient or less than. And, um, you know, that is uh, definitely not in vogue these days, but there is some concern that, okay, the more that we can test and the more that we can know, are we, again, giving rise to, um, to what um, at least one author has called the, quote, the, the new eugenics. So I really don't think that's the case. And the reason why is because if there is a new eugenics, it doesn't really fit that, it doesn't meet the criterion of being state-sponsored. So I think what's different about today is it's being driven largely by parents who are interested in learning more and more about their children and about their genetic profiles before birth. But there is no mandate from the government to, um, to sterilize or to terminate pregnancies that don't meet this, you know, this sterling uh, standard that is arbitrarily set. Okay, let me ask you, and I hate to get into this gnarly issue in relation to something so uh, kind of uh, long uh, into the future and we're looking uh, forward here on America Trends, but the whole gnarly issue of insurance and <laughs> what gets covered if you find out more at an early stage and what you want to do is to prevent or to make certain that you're doing all that you can as quickly as you can if this might present a problem later. Is this an issue that the insurance companies are facing right now? Um, well, you know, it's an issue in terms of legal protections for sure. There is a law on the books called GINA, the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. Um, that and was Ted been, Kennedy, wasn't it? Um, no, I, you know, I believe it was passed during the Bush era. Oh, okay. um, and although I could be wrong about that. Um, and, and so basically what it does is say, um, if you find out genetic information about yourself, um, you health insurers cannot discriminate against you. But here's the interesting thing. You know, as with politi as happens with, you know, every, um, every bill, there is give and take and back and forth and lots of negotiation, and rarely does a law look exactly how the, its sponsors originally envisioned it would look because they have to, um, you know, give, they have to, you know, they have to be flexible on some of the provisions that they ideally had wanted. So Gina does not allow, does not allow protection um, in, um, as it re relates to disability insurance or life insurance. And so, you know, that's a really significant, that's a really significant thing. I spoke with, um, with one of the sponsors of the bill, um, Representative Louise Slaughter of New York, and she explained to me, this is, has been many years now, but she said, you know, of course we wanted life insurance and disability insurance to apply to Gina, but we just, you know, we couldn't get everything we wanted. So health insurance is really critical. But, you know, there is concern that um, the more you find out about yourself and if the, what you find out is not um, 
you know, is concerning, um, that perhaps someone wouldn't be able to get life insurance. That is, um, it's definitely an issue that's very much in flux and I think will continue to be shaped as we, you know, as we continue to learn more and more about our genetic uh, backgrounds and as genetic testing gets more incorporated into healthcare. It's a remarkable field. You've done such a great job in bringing it to life in the gene machine. Just a couple of more questions. Essentially, what should we want to know about our babies as you see it? Um, I, I, again, you know, I don't mean to, to avoid the question, but I think that um, it's so personal. So for me, I wanted to know everything that I possibly could. But, you know, even, and this is an example of how quickly things have changed. So my youngest is nine. And in these past nine years, there have been, um, a myriad of tests that have come on the market that weren't available to me back then. Now, one of these tests that has been used and really is not offered outside of major metropolitan areas is called chromosomal microarray. And it, is, it, it, is so, um, it can dive so deeply into DNA that it can reveal um, really small genetic blips that are, um, so it's small deletions of DNA or small duplications of DNA that are super tiny, so, so much smaller than something like an extra, an entire extra chromosome that causes Down syndrome. And, you know, when you find these little genetic, these little genetic errors, it's almost like, you know, if you're spelling a word and you, a long word, and you leave out one letter, most likely, people reading that word are going to know exactly what you mean. They're going to read right over the missing letter. But, you know, in some cases, um, for example, in a smaller word, if you leave out a letter, you might not be able to figure out what that is. And that is kind of, that's sort of the situation that we find ourselves in. So some of these deletions and duplications um, have been associated with the disease, but so many of them we just have no idea. There's even a term, um, it's called variants of uncertain significance. And so what does it mean? So for example, if you um, have this test and then you find out information about your baby and it's all, it's not, you know, black or white and you don't really know what this means, well, how is that going to help you make a decision about what to do? So I do think that there is a point at which information is kind of the balance shifts. And so for me, that would be with this test. I, if I were to, to get pregnant again, I don't think I would opt for this test because there's so much information that is just not, um, it's not clear. But, you know, there are other people who, uh, you know, one of a family whom I interview in the book who did have the test, did get this uncertain information, did kind of were very on the fence about whether to go ahead with the pregnancy, ultimately decided to have their child. And the boy is adorable and developing normally. And, you know, the parents always have in the back of their mind that he is missing a couple genes, but they, you know, they're just moving along with their life. It hasn't, you know, it hasn't impaired their bonding with their child. And, and they're ultimately, they're really glad that they did it. In a society that is uh, prone uh, to deal with the most immediate and uh, be fad-oriented. Do you worry at all that uh, any of these alterations we might make in response to some of this information uh, might be the wrong response and uh, maybe we're too fleeting our style choices as to uh, what we want to change about ourselves or about our children? Uh, do you worry at all about that given the nature of American society? Well, are you talking about changes like in terms of um, selecting traits? Is that what you're kind of Perhaps, thinking yes. about in the future? Perhaps. Well, you know, I mean, that's a you haven't said the you haven't said the the one term that always comes up in these conversations, which is designer babies. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and you do so, address that in the book. Yeah, I do. Um, so, designer babies. Well, you know, if you really think about what that means. Um, I, I make the case in the book that we're already designing babies, we're designing children, and we do it all the time, every single parent does, by, um, you know, enrolling their 
and enrolling children in various enrichment classes designed to kind of give them a leg up or, you know, a, a math course or, you know, enrolling them, starting them on viol- violin lessons. My son started taking violin when he was four and a half. I guess small comfort is that he asked to do it. But I mean, I didn't dissuade him. And I thought, oh, yes, of course, there is a there's definitely a correlation between um, uh, learning an instrument and brain development. Yes, great. Great idea. So, I mean, we're all trying to to shape and to craft and to mold our children into being sort of the best version of themselves that they can possibly be. So, I think where that um, where that becomes a little dicey is if we're trying to actually select traits. So, there's a fear in society um, about the, about designer babies and what does that mean. So, again. You know, we we don't know. Like I said, genes are not necessarily destiny. And moreover, there's not one particular gene. Like there's not, we don't know what what the the Einstein gene is or what the athleticism gene is that you know can create a future Simone Biles, an amazing uh, you know gold medalist in gymnastics. So uh, again, there are all sorts of genes, and there is um, dedication involved, lots of training involved, um, lots of study involved that helps a person be ex- brilliant or amazing at um, you know double twist uh, layouts. So as far as designing. As far as making designer babies, it's not going to be something that's particularly easy to do because, you know, because there's not a one-to-one correlation of, you know, this gene means that this child is going to be uh, a genius. Um, More likely, what is going to happen is that as um, scientists use CRISPR uh, gene editing technology yes. to try to address disease, you can envision certain situations where, for example, in a muscular dystrophy, where there's a, a, a muscle wasting disease, if, if scientists are able to figure out how to strengthen muscle fibers, for example, in a muscular dystrophy, then you can imagine taking the next step and some uh, parents being interested in saying, okay, oh, well, that's fantastic that you're able to, um, to treat that disease and to strengthen muscle fibers. I wonder if we could use that gene edit to um, strengthen my child. So that's, you know, that's where things get, um, get, um, get tricky. And, and Bonnie, I think my concern concerned. would be that in America with marketing in every realm, that there are going to be people out there who are going to oversell what it is that they are able to do to build the next great athlete or the next great genius or whatever it may be. And I do worry a little bit about the compulsion in our society for bigger, better, and the like, and uh, the fact that there are so many people out there who might misuse information or their own capabilities to sell somebody something. A hundred percent. So I think if, if you want my biggest prediction for the future, it's that the FDA, the Food and Drug Administration, is going to be really busy because <laughs> they, they're the ones who are going to be overseeing all these claims of, um, you know, building better babies or strong children or smart children. Um, so it's really, I think, to a large degree going to be buyer beware. But I, I think the good news is that Scientists and researchers and bioethicists are already very aware of this potential, and they are meeting uh, periodically to talk about rules and, you know, really guidelines surrounding this future that we have to look forward to so that it's not willy-nilly every person on her you know, on her own, pursuing her own crazy idea of, you know, how to build this uh, super race. There is, um, there is oversight, and there will continue to be oversight. Well, Bonnie, you have been terrific. Thank you so much for coming by today on America Trends. The Gene Machine is the book, How Genetic Technologies Are Changing the Way We Have Kids and the Kids We Have. Bonnie Rockman, thank you again. Thank you so much. It was a pleasure.
If you like this episode of America Trends Podcast, will you please leave us a kind rating or a review on iTunes? John, is that too much to ask? No, or even a comment. Give Anything. us in the comment section on the ones that you liked. And, you know, you can also email me at newsletter at rifkinradio.com. And that's another way you can contact us with uh, your ideas. Don't forget, your review really is important to us. And, John, they may say, why? Why? Why is it so important? Well, the yeah, more why? you... Why? <laughs> tell us. You're even asking why? that. Why? <laughs> well, the more you like us, the better placement we get, which then helps us improve our rankings and visibility so that more people can enjoy us. And the more people... John, you see how this is I spiraling? It. It's getting out of control. <laughs> the more people who know about us <laughs> and like our content, the greater chance we have to encourage advertisers to hop aboard. You see how it works now, John? I, I understand now. That's very interesting. And we don't want these folks who are listening to miss a single episode of America Trends Podcast. I mean, we're recording tons of them aren't we no and they're all very interesting and we got some really good stuff coming up oh we really do but we want you to subscribe on itunes or stitcher.com and when you do subscribe let us know on facebook and twitter our handle on both platforms is at trends podcast we want to thank you personally for subscribing. In fact, John may have a very beautiful thank you gift. John, what is it? <laughs> no? We no. ran out of them? All out of gifts. Oh, sweet. my goodness. Well, <laughs> Sorry please, about that. <laughs> please send us your ideas and questions for future episodes and topics on America Trends Podcast. We can't think of them all, right, John? That's right. I mean, my we head's can't. already exploding. Oh, yes. You see it. <laughs> I Cloud see above. It. <laughs> is there an author you'd love to hear from? or a subject you'd like to learn more about, send us your ideas on Facebook and Twitter. And by the way, you can direct message us at, at Trends Podcast or use hashtag Trends Podcast. You can also add an email address if you have one that you want to give out. And we do not, right, John? We don't share no, our list. No spamming, no list getting out. You just get our newsletter. Absolutely. And you can access our full show archive on our website at americatrendspodcast.com. For more information on America Trends and for the latest updates on our upcoming episodes, be sure to like our page on Facebook and follow us on Twitter. You can find us at Trends Podcast. Oh, by the way, and John, this is really important, and you know What that. is it? What is it? Well, if you buy from Amazon, we have joined their associates program. So you go to americatrendspodcast.com before you purchase, and you click over to Amazon from our Amazon store. That's a very good point, because it doesn't cost them any more money to do that. No, that's all built in. And then we get a few pesos. Yeah, helps but keep the look, podcast going. You know, if we get a small VIG, you know, 2 or 3%, if you don't do it through us, you're just giving more money to Jeff Bezos. Exactly. And he doesn't need any more he money. He doesn't need it. That's and he doesn't correct. do any podcasts, <laughs> I don't think. So please, with no added cost to you, it helps us to bring you the content that you're enjoying. And thanks. Thanks, everybody. Please keep listening.